Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Jim, Matthew, Michael, Jack, Jack, Tony, Jay. My name is Kat. Susan. My name is Jerry. <coughs> My name is Stephanie. My name is Ray. George. I'm Brad. And I'll introduce you in a moment. <laughs> and let's just take a minute um, to notice who's online. Andreas, Bill, Bob, Charles, Chris. Chris, again, <laughs> Chris Wolf, Daniel, Francis, Frisco, George, Harley, Henry, Jason, Kay, Marcelo, Marvin, Michael, Richard, Richard again, Samuel, Tim, Tom, another Tom, Will, and all of us in person, you can wave to everyone here and there, and everybody on Zoom uh, <laughs> will put you back on the gallery view here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right, well, welcome, and it is my pleasure to introduce Renee. Uh, Renee's a meditation teacher, restorative justice facilitator, and leader working and learning in all the spaces in between race, gender, and other perceived binaries as a queer, mixed race, trans man. Renee teaches heart centered, trauma informed meditation at the East Bay Meditation Center and other meditation centers. He has co-led the first residential meditation retreats for transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive people. Renee is a restorative justice facilitator for the Ahisma Collective, working to heal sexual and gender-based violence. All right, Renee. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. This is my first time teaching in person since February 2020. <laughs> so it's very exciting. And I was just feeling the difference of sitting, you know, with my body actually here, with those bodies who are here, as well as those who are on Zoom. Um, but there's something different in my nervous system that's settling in this experience of, of actually being able to be together again. So grateful for this opportunity. And uh, my topic today is bringing compassion to the conflict in our hearts. And I wanted to start us off with a poem. It's a poem that's been like meaningful to me for a long time, actually. I'm not sure when it was written. It's a poet named Dina Metzger, and uh, folks may be familiar with her. It's very short. She says, there are those who are trying to set fire to the world. We are in danger. There is time only to work slowly. There is no time not to love. I'm just going to read that one more time since it's so short. <laughs> there are those who are trying to set fire to the world. We are in danger. There is time only to work slowly. There is no time not to love. And I was actually, like this poem had come to my heart and I went on her website a few weeks ago and noticed that she actually put it kind of at the top and with this note, and she said, we are once again in a conflagration, once again at war. Once again, we must find the heart of peace. Even now, put out the fires, even those in our own hearts. So that was her note from February 24th, just a few weeks ago. And um, yeah, it's like, we have really been um, thinking of this poem as a war has been very much in my consciousness, you know, not that we haven't been at war, because I think we've been at, this world, our world has been at war 
at every moment, I think, at least within my own lifetime, and maybe for many lifetimes. And, you know, recognizing that the war in the Ukraine affects us, maybe in a different way than some of the other ongoing wars that have been happening in Syria and other places. Um, so I wanted to, like, really bring some inquiry to this question of, um, you know, how do we bring our mindfulness to the experience of conflict inside ourselves and outside ourselves? Um, how do we bring compassion to conflict, again, inside and outside of ourselves? Um, and I was listening to a teacher who's been really important to me over the last couple of years, Lama Rod Owens. I think probably every time I'm here, <laughs> I bring Lama Rod in because his dharma is really alive for me. So he was just talking this past Monday. Um, he teaches through a sangha called Bumis Barsha, and they have a, he has a Monday. He has a Monday talk called Medicine Buddha. So he was just this past Monday. He was talking, um, and he also said this piece from the poem. He said the only way forward is to slow down. I thought, oh, it's really it's like resonance with this piece um, around with the urgency of conflict. Can we invite ourselves to slow down? And also noticing, just like even noticing in this moment, you know, how is it to bring our attention to conflict? You know, just feeling it into, in our bodies and, in, you know, can we feel the peace that might be inside ourselves? Like, I'll notice for myself, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can feel the, um, you know, maybe you all came for, you know, some moment of escape from from violence and conflict, and I'm bringing it right into the room. Like, um, there's a little internal conflict inside of me. Was this the right topic? <laughs> Maybe they just want to hear about um, loving kindness, <laughs> right? And so, also noticing in you, is there some conflict right inside of you, even in this moment of? Um, um, Maybe part of you wanting to be here and part of you not wanting to be here. Something like that. So just inviting that, noticing. And another teacher who's been important for me recently um, is a trans woman from Toronto. Her name is Kai Cheng Tong. And she talks a lot about conflict. Um, she's a conflict mediator, also a somatic sex educator, also a meditator. Um, and I've just been learning a lot from her about a lot of different things, but I was also taking a, a there's a embodied justice summit through the Embody Lab a couple weeks ago. And she was um, really talking about like the experience of conflict, and she pointed out um, something that like when she said it, I was like, oh, this is so obvious, but I hadn't thought of it before. She said, just can we notice that any time there's external conflict, there's also internal. And she was talking about particularly when we're working within, you know, interpersonal conflict or conflict within our groups or organizations, just noticing that, you know, that that um, the conflict is not just in the group, it's also inside of us. And I thought that was uh, this interesting reflection of a piece from the Satipatthana Sutta, um, where the Buddha brings in this refrain through that sutta about pointing to the way that we bring our mindfulness internally, externally, and both internally and externally. So the sutta says something like, um, they abide contemplating the body internally, they abide contemplating the body externally, and they abide, abide contemplating the body both internally and externally. And then that repeats for every piece of the four foundations of mindfulness, whether it's the body, feeling tone, thoughts, um, mind objects, or dhammas. So it just really resonated for me, this piece of like, oh, it is both inside me and outside of me. And, um, and, um, from this talk just this past Monday from Lama Rod, he says, we see war in the world where there is war inside of me. 
there is tension inside of me. There is a desire to harm inside of me. So as you are working to disrupt war in the world, we also have to disrupt war in our interpersonal experience, in our internal experience. If the internal experience isn't worked on, then you just recre recreate the systems in the external world. If I really want to disrupt the violence that I see in the world, then I need to get serious about disrupting violence in my own system by cultivating compassion and wisdom, care and clarity. And he points out that this is like the heart of the bodhisattva path, is this, um, this work, this work of actually disrupting the violence inside of ourselves so that we can meaningfully disrupt the violence that we see in the world. Um, and that was resonating for me also in just my own experience. And I was thinking, um, actually back to childhood, um, I had the experience, and maybe others have also, of actually having like engaged in bullying behavior with other kids when I was a kid. It's really like around the kind of 10, 11 years old, that age. And, um, you know, I was a big, I was a big kid, I was like the biggest kid in my class, and um, I also came from a family background of a lot of neglect, on a lot of different levels. Um, this was the 70s, many of us <laughs> were kind of left on our own a lot, um, I certainly had that experience, and, um, and also just to, like not getting much care or contact or direction from my parents. And so I was left, left to just figure things out on my own. And I can remember at that age, like I really wanted to figure out how to relate to people. I wanted to even understand, like, do I even have an impact on others? You know, that was one of the things that I struggled with with my own family. Like, do I even have, a, you know, am I even important here? And so I kind of did that with other kids through bullying. Um, in a way just to try and understand like how am I impacting this person? Is this person really like can I really contact them? And I was doing that through through violence, um, uh, both physically and kind of emotionally. And I can remember once just like hauling off and just socking my friend Keith, like for no reason, you know, and then I really got this reads like, oh wow, that hurt him. Like he was hurt. He didn't fight back, he was just like hurt. And another time I can remember like realizing that I could just hurt people with words and I was like one of my classmates, I just was saying really cruel things to him until he started crying. And then I was like, oh, he's actually really hurt, like I've hurt him. And, and I kind of came to a place where I was like, you know what, I've been sort of investigating this experience and I actually don't want like that was something I came to kind of on my own around 11 or so. And it was interesting that I sort of made a vow to myself. Like I'm not gonna hurt people. I don't wanna hurt people. And I really lived by that. And it's sort of like, I didn't even know about the Bodhisattva <laughs> path. But it was interesting that like I came to that sort of vow within myself just from my own direct experience of what is it like to hurt somebody else. Um, so I think I was really resonating with this piece from this quote of like, this is really the heart of our commitment to non-harming is really like examining it within ourselves and stopping the violence within ourselves, which is often violence towards ourselves as well as violence towards others. Like it is those things are really um, connected very deeply. Um, and I really noticed that in my own work as I work with um, holding restorative justice processes where I'm working often both with the person who's been harmed as well as the person who's done harm. You can really see this connection between the ways that we are hurting ourselves and the ways that we can then hurt other people. So yeah, so I just wanna turn to this question of um, you know, how do we actually dismantle? How do we actually disrupt this violence? Um, both within ourselves and towards others. And also, just noticing, like we're always practicing something, you know? 
when we're on the cushion, when we're practicing meditation, but at all times we're practicing something. So we're practicing, um, you know, negative messages towards ourselves, like beating ourselves up for not doing something that we said we were going to do, or, um, you know, like being self-critical, all of that is this, um, is practicing something. And, you know, so how can we be really actively practicing nonviolence? How can we be practicing compassion as an antidote? Um, so, and Lama Rod also in this talk was saying, he says, karma is rehearsal. Whatever we have been rehearsing, we will do really well. If we have been doing violence, then we will do violence really well. If we have been rehearsing compassion, then we will do compassion really well. So, just noticing that that's, um, that what we practice, what we cultivate, is really uh, what will grow. You know, I think Thich Nhat Hanh speaks to this as well. Many teachers have pointed to this. So one of the things, you know, that I, you know, one place that I've explored for myself is even just noticing what is my own conditioning around conflict. And, um, you know, I'm someone who sometimes can be very comfortable with conflict in groups and different spaces and sometimes very uncomfortable with it. And so I was really noticing and going back and unpacking my own experience that I kind of had these two very different um, role models of my parents. I had a father who was a civil rights activist, who was someone who, you know, brought a lot of energy and was fueled by anger in his work, but I also saw it really focused outwards, focused towards, like, the anger being a generating force for change, anger being a way to take action in the world, and it was focused towards towards others, you know, wasn't focused inwards towards me or the family. And um, so it seemed like actually a positive force, even though it was also often quite a scary and chaotic force. So it was, I was, had a, you know, kind of mixed feelings about that, but I definitely saw that it was positive. And, um, and at the same time, my mother was very conflict avoidant and um, just never saw her ever, and I, there was a time when I was really like trying to get her to be angry with me because I thought if she was angry with me, I would really know that she cared. And um, so I just provoke her by not doing things that I was supposed to do and that kind of thing. And one day, she just like, she finally sort of like snapped and I remember she was holding a wooden spoon and, um, and she just brought it down on the counter and actually the little edge of the spoon broke. And I just would always remember, because we had that spoon and for the rest of the time until I left home. And I would always think of that moment. Um, but she was like, if you don't want to be here, you can just leave. And I was like, well, I'm 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was really shocked. <laughs> And I got, in that moment, on some level, like, there were a bunch of messages. One, of course, was that maybe she didn't love me and didn't want me. But also that, like, she was so unwilling to engage in conflict that she would rather I left than have conflict. You know, which is a pretty intense um, fear of conflict. So it's just interesting to, like, then come forward to my life now. And in some way, like, I actually, the work that I do is, is all about conflict. Um, you know, aside from meditation work, the facilitation work is, is always around conflict. And I'm very comfortable with that. I've also been very comfortable as an organizer, an activist, and managing organizational conflict. It's always been a place, actually, I feel quite comfortable. And at the same time, when I look at my intimate relationships, you know, partners, dating, um, I'm super conflict avoidant in that realm. And we'll like really go to great lengths to like make sure that people aren't angry at me or upset with me. So it's just really interesting to see, 
even just in these two realms, I hold conflict completely differently. So at some point I realized, oh, I've got transferable skills here. <laughs> and I started to bring some of my love of, you know, and comfort with conflict more into the intent realm, and that's been helpful. Um, but even just to have that, you know, even just going through that inquiry was really helpful for me, because I was like, oh, um, I've really been shaped by these experiences, and, um, and just to see how it plays out in my life now, that then helped me to kind of um, realize that conflict could also be a more positive or generative force in intimate relationships. Um, so anyway, that, that kind of inquiry, I think, can be, um, can be really, really helpful as we unpack these, um, these con conditions. And you know, one of the things I want to also point out around the ways that we can avoid conflict is that sometimes even within our Buddhist communities and cultures, there can be this um, aspect of conflict avoidance. And I've certainly encountered it as I've been part of, you know, in different governance roles with different Buddhist communities and centers. So just like also watching out for the ways that sometimes we can have a kind of a bypass around conflict and even sometimes conflict or anger gets labeled as unskillful or spiritually immature. Um, and so, you know, can we notice when this comes up and can we also notice is, are there times when we do that to ourselves? Um, even just in the sense of like, you know, I just don't want, you know, like I don't want this internal conflict or I don't want to be in conflict with this person and that pushing away that we can do. Or sometimes when we're, like I've noticed this on every single board of directors I've ever sat on, there's always that one person who's difficult. <laughs> and there's like the sense that if we just got that one person off the board. <laughs> <laughs> and what I've noticed is every time you get that one person off the board, some new person becomes the difficult person. It's almost like it's a role that someone needs to occupy. <laughs> so there's like, even when we try to push it away, like that, um, you know, there's some kind of group conflict that is present and somebody needs to be bringing it to the surface. Um, and when you get rid of that person or don't talk about it, the conflict doesn't actually go away. So just really noticing that piece and um, Martin Luther King actually really pointed to this in a, in a speech that he gave called When Peace Becomes Obnoxious. And he was, um, wrote this speech right after uh, um, they were working to integrate the University of Alabama. And there was a young woman named Authorine Lucy who was the um, black student who was brought in to integrate that university, and she was met with just incredible violence, as you can imagine, just hordes of people yelling and spitting on her, and, and it, was, it was just awful. And then um, the university was like, okay, we can't do this. Like, you can't come and study here. And so then Martin Luther King wrote this, this speech because there was like in the news, the headline in the newspaper the next day after they expelled authoring, it said, peace reigns on the University of Alabama campus or something like that. Like peace is restored. <laughs> and, um, and so K King said that this calm is the type of peace that stinks in the nostrils of the um, almighty God. Mm -hmm. um, and he, like, he recounts another conversation that he had with someone who was suggesting that the bus boycott that was also happening at the same time was destroying race relations and peace in the community. And so King responds, yes, it is true that if the Negro accepts his place, accepts exploitation and injustice, there will be peace, but it would be an obnoxious peace. And he also talks about this as the peace of oppression. And so, you know, can we look at the ways that sometimes we try to create that kind of peace where we're not actually get, resolving the conflict, we're just trying to remove either someone 
in our, you know, sphere or some part of our own selves that is, that we see as the troublemaking part. You know, like try to squash that troublemaking part so that we can have peace. And that peace, you know, King would call the peace of oppression. And that can even be a kind of a self-oppression. And I think, um, you know, myself in my now two decades plus of meditation practice, I feel I have to watch out for this even within my own practice. This, um, you know, wanting quiet, wanting peace, Am I sometimes like pushing down parts of myself to get it? And my practice has sort of shifted to, towards how can I actually be using my practice in an enlivening way that's bringing to the surface feelings, even really uncomfortable ones, um, rather than kind of pushing those away so that I can have this sense of internal quiet or peace or ease. And um, I've really been really supported in this with the practices of Lama Rod Owens, particularly what he calls the seven homecomings practice. It's a benefactor practice really designed to bring in a sense of being cared for by all of our benefactors, including Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the earth, our ancestors and lineage holders, ourselves, silence. So we're sort of building this container of care and I find within that container of care, I have a lot more capacity to let the difficult feelings just be there and move through me by building kind of this support. Um, and that, um, you know, I think really kind of starts to point to the compassion and care that we can bring that can really be in a way to, um, to hold the conflict inside of ourselves or in, around us um, without pushing it away. It's like really surrounding it with care and compassion. And also noticing that like times when we might be in internal or external conflict, it is oftentimes when some important need of ours is not getting met. So another piece of like reducing violence towards ourselves and others is really making sure that we are, are getting our needs met that we're caring for ourselves, that we're asking for what we need, um, that we're say, setting the boundaries that we need to set. Um, from this talk on Monday, Lama Rod said, if I want to be the least violent person, version of myself, I have to make sure I'm getting my needs met. Getting my needs met in a way that is ethical, that is sustainable, that is consensual. So really noticing that this work of just getting our needs met and holding our boundaries um, is an important part of reducing violence. And it's, and it's like a little counterintuitive because sometimes it feels like when we're saying a no or asking for something that we're not getting from someone else, like a partner, that that feels like it's creating conflict. But it is bringing to the surface something that's already present. And so there might be this like, um, oh, I don't want to rock the boat here, but that conflict is already there. It's either, am I going to just hold it within myself, or am I actually going to bring it in the into the space so that it could be resolved by this person being like, oh, okay, now I know not to do that, or, oh, I didn't know that you needed that. Here, you know, I can do that. Or they can say, no, I can't do that for you, and then you can go some months. So, um, yeah, there's a way that sometimes by avoiding conflict, we keep ourselves in our own internal conflict. Yeah, so just um, coming back to this like piece of compassion, you know, I feel like, um, you know, the work I do around, around conflict, I'm always first bringing a lot of compassion for myself in the hard work of holding conflict for myself and others, and then also really bringing compassion to everyone in the conflict, including those who I'm in conflict with. So even just really like bringing our compassion practice right into that experience of conflict. Um, and, you know, bringing in our phrases, could be directed towards ourselves or others. I care about your suffering. I'm here with you in this pain, 
your suffering matters to me, I wish things were different. So just like really bringing our practice right to that experience, even when we're in conflict with someone. And really recognizing that, you know, we've got kind of all, you know, I've been talking about, oh, we've got internal conflict and external conflict. But I sort of think of it as these concentric circles with ourselves at the center and our internal conflict. And then we might have like interpersonal or intimate conflict. And then there's like the groups that we're a part of. And then there's institutions and systems where conflict is present. And then there's sort of this geopolitical sphere that we started with of like conflict between nations. And then even at a bigger level, there's kind of a conflict, um, almost an existential conflict of our life on this earth and the ways that, that some aspects of how we live are in conflict with the earth itself. So there's so many spheres, and can we really send compassion at all of these levels, knowing also that they're all interconnected, um, and that we're feeling all of that inside of our bodies. Um, yeah, and going back to an, uh, another piece from Kai Cheng Tom, she says, when we put compassion and curiosity together, we often get conflict, conflict de-escalation. So this is just really great noticing that when we bring these two qualities together, our compassion and our curiosity, um, often conflict can, can de-escalate. Um, and so like, even can we practice that with ourselves, with our own internal conflict, really bringing not just compassion, but our curiosity to that experience. And then just notice what happens. And um, yeah, and I feel like I could talk, I could like, this could be a day long, I have many more <laughs> thoughts around how we actually practice. Um, practice being less violent with ourselves, being more kind, and how that ripples out. But I wanted to really end with the practice of gratitude because I feel like gratitude is another practice that is, for me, very much a daily, as many times as I can touch into it, practice, and it also feels like it's um, directly addressing how to be kinder to myself and others. And my experience in turning my attention to gratitude as often as possible, um, what I notice is, is it brings me into relationship. So when I, if I'm just like, you know, right now walking down the street in my neighborhood, there's this like, the wisteria is starting to bloom and it's so beautiful and it smells so good. And I walk by and I feel this great gratitude for all of that beauty. And it's just right there, it's so accessible to me. Or just having a meal and thinking of like, this food has come to me from the earth. It's come to me through other, the hands of other people. Offering my gratitude is bringing myself into a relationship with, with the earth and with others. Um, yeah, so, is, so I really love gratitude just not only as a practice of gladdening the heart, resourcing ourselves, but also bringing ourselves into kinship and reciprocity and connection with all of life. And also like, you know, it's something that we can do, you know, it's interesting that when we use the word feedback, we often really think of that as like people telling us stuff we don't want to hear. <laughs> um, but actually it can also be a way that we can appreciate people. And can we bring more appreciation just into our relationships? Because that can be really resourcing for the moments with those same folks when we need to hold conflict. So, um, yeah, so I want to leave us with gratitude, and so I want to do just a brief practice of gratitude. And um, this can be done sitting, standing, in any position, but I'm going to stay seated since um, and I know everyone will be able to see me. And this comes from a, um, actually a somatics lineage called generative somatics. 
And I invite us just first to like bring our hands together if this feels available and just bring a little warmth, friction into the hands, just feeling that contact, feeling a little warmth start to generate maybe some aliveness. And then to take our hands and extend them towards the earth. Just continuing to feel the aliveness in our palms, some energy, and to send that energy towards the earth with our gratitude. And we might think to ourselves of a few things that we're grateful to the earth for. You know, I'm just thinking of being grateful to the earth for feeding me, for all of the beautiful flowers that are coming out right now, and for providing a home. And just any other things that come to mind in our gratitude for the earth. And then extending up, and we can do this, you know, physically or just energetically. If you want to just stay still, you can do this energetically. Extending our gratitude towards the sky. And, you know, um, anything that comes to mind is we're grateful for the sky. I'm thinking of the rain, the uh, raindrops I felt this morning when I was walking my dog. I'm thinking of the moon, feeling connected to the cosmos through seeing the moon, and also a sense of spaciousness. And just anything else that comes to mind as we think of our gratitude towards the sky. And then extending our arms out to our sides and extending gratitude towards community. We can actually extend our gratitude towards each other in this room and on the Zoom including members of the community who are not here, extending towards other people in our lives that we're grateful for. Just inviting in anyone who we want to extend some gratitude towards. And then finally, bringing our hands to our own bodies any place that feels good, and extending our gratitude towards ourselves. We might appreciate just that we showed up here today. We might appreciate ourselves for having done the dishes. Appreciate ourselves for ways that we have cared for ourselves. And just anything else that we want to extend gratitude to ourselves for. And then just letting that practice go. Thank you for joining me in that practice. Yeah, so we have a little bit of time. Um, if folks have any thoughts, any questions, Curious, you know, how your practice might help you in navigating internal or external conflict. So I just want to open up if anyone here in the room or anyone on Zoom has any any questions or thoughts. Jeff, yeah. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I really liked how you brought systems theory and balance and things and our tendency to speak, seek homeostasis together. And I'm wondering if if you think maybe we have a, you know, nature seems to be drawn to homeostasis. It's maybe a uh, sort of built-in blind spot that we have sometimes to over uh, balance out of you know, discomfort and uh, with conflict. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, um, uh, what's coming to mind is, is like kind of a, a little bit of an opposite thing, which is like I'm reading um, 
right now, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wendrow. Um, kind of a sociological look back through um, prehistory and, you know, is there really, it's looking at the origins of inequality, but really asking the question, is there really um, Can we make any kind of narrative around that? But one of the things I talk about a lot is schismogenesis, which is our tendency as cultures to define ourselves, both as individuals and cultures, to define ourselves in opposition to others. So it's just very interesting, and they talk a lot about cultures, like, like one example is they talk about the difference between the indigenous tribes of the Pacific Northwest and the indigenous tribes of California, and that they seem to have like actually developed in opposition to each other, with um, with the California tribes really loving austerity and being absolutely refusing slavery, and the Pacific Northwest tribes having this very opulent um, visual culture and um, employing slaves and um, anyway, it's just like this very interesting question of like actually, you know, how do we also have built into both human culture and in some ways nature and um, this piece of difference, you know, and I think that sees it in like the physical manifestation of animals. But anyway, so is there also some some piece of both of those things yeah. that we both seek homeostasis yeah. or peace, and we also yeah. Yeah. like our own self conception can yeah. sometimes come out of opposition. Yeah, in division. So it's like a paradox. Yeah. Yes. What's the word you use? Schismo. Schismogenesis. Fascinating. And it's a uh, yeah. The, the idea is that you create your own identity through being as opposite as possible to someone else. Yes, yes. Sometimes you see this in twins, you know, mm -hmm. like they're exactly alike, but they'll like, you know, decide to have very different hairstyles or yeah. really different interests or something like that. So we can kind of like find ourselves in our differences from yeah. others. The other thing I wanted to compliment you on is that, you know, uh, the Ram Dass used to talk a lot about activists uh, who were demonstrating for peace and who were just so angry, such angry people, <laughs> driven by anger rather than compassion or uh, inner peace. Right. Yeah. It's good to see there's more and more places where like people who are activists get to go on a meditation retreat or get to have like some contemplative time because that fuel of anger is great in the short term, but it's terrible mm -hmm. over the long term. Yeah. And really looking at how within our movements, sometimes people are doing a lot more to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes just out of burnout. And yeah. Other, um, other folks? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, I just have a couple of comments to make because I thought so many of the things you said <clears throat> were so interesting. I also like, you know, I was thinking, listening to what Jeff said, and you comment too, and yes, the, we, we, we strive to have this sense of homeostasis, and ultimately things arrive at homeostasis, but homeostasis does not necessarily mean this is like fair and equitable. Homeostasis, yeah. to me, is like a balance which may exist by virtue of constraint conflict. I don't know how to say it different than that, but I think that I think that's really interesting to think about. And I also really appreciated your your speaking to the the many layers of our consciousness and the reality that there are probably conflictual dynamics happening on any one of a number of them and also the several layers of our experience reality. And being aware and reconciling those is that's particularly challenging because we want to experience homeostasis. Right? Right. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. it's pretty provocative. I'm mean, very provocative. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Henry on, the, on Zoom has his hand up. Go ahead. <coughs> uh, uh, yes, Renee, thank, thank you for your talk. Uh, I, I just wanted to say I identified with uh, some of what you were talking about because. My father 
was a social worker and very involved in the community. And at the same time, he was a pretty angry person. And uh, the anger mostly came out toward my brother. I learned how to be the good, the good son. And uh, so that was my, that was my solution. Just avoid, avoid the wrath. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I, I, that's how I relate to what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I relate to that too, though. My, when I was growing up, my father directed his anger outwards. Once he started to really age, he started to direct it at us. And that was a very difficult. But then I was, at least I was an adult at that point. But I definitely, that can be, unfortunately, really common. You know, folks who are really revered in the community for their activism can sometimes be causing harm in their intimate relationships. Yeah, thank you, Henry, for sharing. Bob and Chris have a Bob, go ahead. Thank you for your talk. You evoke some memory to me. Your description of the incident with your mother and the wooden spoon mm. led me to my own childhood memories and realization that one or both of my parents really did not know how to express their love for me, mm -hmm. which looking back, I know was there. Right. Could it, be that, could it be that your mother loved you, didn't express it well, and could not believe that you did not understand that she loved you? Could that have been the source of her anger and not that she didn't love you? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I definitely understand that now, but I did not understand that as a kid. Mm -hmm. They had no capacity to understand that these people who were... Um, you know, just didn't really have the capacity to care for me or express their love for me. Um, you know, like the words were used, but because the care wasn't there, you know, I didn't even know what love meant because I wasn't getting that attention and care that is the way the child experiences love. So I understand all of that now, but that was not my, not my experience them, but I'm grateful for understanding that, you know, that my parents truly did love me, but they didn't have the capacity to show it. Chris? Renee, thanks so much for your talk. Um, this is the only, this is the second time I've heard you. I heard you last year, and each time I've felt a, a strong sense of just, you gave me something, and it changed through your talk, and I can walk forward with that um, learning as she offered it out. I um, This sense of self-violence is so strong, I'm sure for all of us, but it's very much for me, having all the bullying, et cetera. And if I'm, it comes up certainly, and when I, I, I have the power now or the strength through these practices to look at it, to work with it and allow it to dissolve and disappear. Um, and this practice of putting your hands down was really, really wonderful. I'm all ready to do that one hourly. I just learned one now where you put your fingers behind your ear, press your bones just lightly, and then put your fingers across your forehead, and it, it soothes your parasympathetic system, and it's calming. So when I'm having these thoughts in a moment, don't press hard, very lightly on that bone, and across, and just enjoy it. It's like heart, hand to the heart. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. And I think if, unless there's anybody else, I want to turn over to your announcements. Yeah. But thanks everyone for your questions and um, reflections. All right. Are there any announcements for the group? Yes. Yes, my name is Jen. I'm your host. I don't believe there's anyone here for the first time, so I will um, not go through the whole list. But um, I'll be going around with the Donna Bowl. Donna uh, covers all of our expenses and allows us to be the uh, great force for society and uh, internal life that it is. And so please be generous. You can go, uh, for you guys on Zoom, you can go to the, our website and uh, make a donation, or you can send a check to an address there. And I will be going around with a bowl here. There are some snacks, some 
fruit and some packaged things that may amuse you. There's, there's a, uh, uh, hot water for tea, just put your cups in the sink and I'll clean them up. And um, people typically gather at the door who want to go out to lunch together at, at 12.30, so feel free to join. And um, next week I don't have I don't have the, the name of the speaker. Padma Tara, who's next uh, week. I could read it by it. Okay, great. Yes, Jeff? Uh, I'm very happy to announce the launch of our new website at the same address. Uh, Tom and Henry and Jerry and I worked very hard for a long, long time. And uh, I think you'll find it much snazzier and, and helpful <laughs> sexy. and sexier. <laughs> yeah. Oh really, what page is that on? <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> oh, I want to recommend a movie to your topic. It's called The Lost Daughter. Um, it's about a woman who was in great conflict with being a mother. And it's, it's shockingly strong and moving. Oh yes. I yeah. just like I just, um, the question has come up about wearing masks here. Does is, does it, anybody have strong feelings about whether we should maintain them or um, maybe it's time to uh, we can start uh, meeting without the masks? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, you know, Padmatar is the head here. We probably have. Actually, not. No, you don't have to. Why? Fine, it's not working. Did anybody not come? If, hmm? well, didn't you wear masks? Well, let's take them off. Take them off. <laughs> 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 you mean like right now? Oh, that's so stifling. I baked cookies. Oh, great. Thank you, Jason. All right, so next week, uh, Pavatara began meditating in 1989, became interested in Buddhism in Brighton, England, around the same time. She was ordained into the Teratna Buddhist order in 2005. She loves to practice, share her practice with others through teaching and study, especially on retreats. She's also trained as a focusing guide, a kind of mindful body-oriented therapy. Padmatara became center director of the San Francisco Buddhist Center in 2010 and shares the role of chair with other members of the council. So she'll be speaking next week. Great. And well, she'll be in person, I'm assuming. Yep. Yes. <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Renee, do you have a uh, dedication of merit that you'd like to use, or would you like to use our right room? Um, yeah, go ahead and do yours. Okay, cast, you know. She's out of room. Alright, so we get the circle. By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow. And the causes of sorrow may all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow, and may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.